chapter six, which is called Surface Pressure and Wind Patterns. And at the beginning of this video, I wanted to say for both chapter six and chapter seven that this is content that I already cover in great detail in both Geography 1250 Weather and Climate and Geography 1260 Weather Studies Laboratory. <clears throat> so I'm going to move through this pretty quickly, and I'm going to assume that you've already seen a lot of this content. I would say that probably 90 to 95% of this content has already been has already been discussed in my classes. If you have not taken Geography 1250 from me, I'm the only one who teaches throughout Geography 1260, but if you've taken Geography 1250 from somebody other than me, then you have some catch up to do probably. So um, if you need to play catch up, feel free to contact me. I think almost everything you need is already in our text, <clears throat> but if there's something that you still need, by all means, contact me either via the discussion board or during my office hours, and I'll help you to get what you need to get to finish off this content. But for the vast majority of you, you've seen this, and I'm going to move quickly. So even if you don't remember it, you've got notes to go back to. So having said that, let's get started. I have my PowerPoint up here, and I'm going to start my slideshow right now. <clears throat> so what I want to do is just go back and review by defining pressure. So pressure is actually a measure of the force of the atmosphere on the Earth's surface or at any point above the Earth's surface. It's basically a measure of weight, how much the atmosphere weighs. So if we talk about high pressure or low pressure at the surface, what we're really talking about is the weight of the atmosphere column from the top of the atmosphere all the way down to the Earth's surface. <clears throat> and what a high means is that the weight of the atmosphere column at the location where we put that H is a maximum. So the Earth's atmosphere column weighs a lot there, relatively speaking. And low is just the opposite. That just means that the weight of the column at this location is relatively low. Now pressure or weight always decreases as you go upward. And it doesn't, measure if we're doesn't matter if we're talking about our own weight when we stand on the scale, or whether we're talking about the weight of the atmosphere column. As you go up through the column, or you go up through your own body, your weight decreases because the scale or the barometer is only able to measure what's going on above it. And so as we go up through the atmosphere column, an increasing amount of that weight is located beneath our barometer, and the barometer is only able to measure what's above it. So as we go up through the atmosphere, we're up through any column, the weight is always going to decrease until we get to the top of the atmosphere where the weight becomes zero because there's simply no weight above the top of the atmosphere. <clears throat> now, with humans, our weight decreases relatively linearly or relatively evenly as we go up from our feet to the tops of our head. This is not the case with the atmosphere. With the atmosphere, these blue dots are actually meant to depict atoms and molecules. And what you see is that a lot of the mass in the atmosphere is actually concentrated near the Earth's surface. And so as you go up from the surface to the top of the atmosphere, weight decreases relatively quickly as you move through all of this stuff. And then as you go higher up in the atmosphere, the rate at which weight decreases diminishes. So what you see is that most of the weight is concentrated at the bottom of the atmosphere. We get a very rapid decrease in weight or pressure as we begin to go up. And then that rate of decrease diminishes as we continue to go up through the atmosphere. So what we see <clears throat> is that if we take a look at this blue line right here, this basically shows us what our pressure is doing as we go up through the atmosphere. So the y the y-axis is altitude, either in kilometers on the left side or miles on the y side, and the x-axis is pressure. And what you see is that as we begin to go up through the atmosphere, pressure decreases very, very rapidly lower in the atmosphere. And as we continue to go up, what we see is that our pressure has decreased already very rapidly by the time we get to less than 10 miles above the Earth's surface. And then from there up, you can see that the rate of decrease is actually quite small. So in fact, what we see is that pressure is an exponential function in the atmosphere, where the rate of decrease is quite large at the surface and as we go up from the surface, and then it becomes increasingly small or decreases as we get higher in the atmosphere. Now the depth of the atmosphere is a couple of hundred miles, and, we, and because of this exponential decrease, what you see is that 90% of the atmosphere in terms of weight is actually in the lowest 10 miles or so of the atmosphere. 99% of the atmosphere's weight is in the lowest 20 miles of the atmosphere. 
And so even though the thickness of the atmosphere is a couple hundred miles, what you see is that virtually all of the atmosphere in terms of its weight is in the lowest 20 miles or so above the Earth's surface. <clears throat> now, what we see because of the fact that atmospheric weight decreases so quickly above the Earth's surface is that if we take a look at surface pressure, and then we're looking at the United States here, if we talk about surface pressure, <clears throat> this is the actual weight of the atmosphere measured by a barometer. And what you see is that the surface pressure is pretty close to 1,000 uh, millibars as you get close to the coasts where the actual elevation of the, of, the land, of the land surface in terms of North America is close to zero. It's almost at sea level. <clears throat> now, as you move into the mountains and you get into the Rockies, the Rockies obviously are at high elevations and they're, rel and they're far, far above sea level. And what you see is that in the high Rockies, the surface pressure actually falls below 800 millibars. And so if we were measuring surface pressure day in and day out, what we would find is that the lowest pressures would always be in the high Rockies and the highest pressures would always be along the coastlines where we're already at sea level. And there's some variation in this, but this is always what we'll find, particularly in terms of lowest pressure. So in order to actually get a more accurate representation of how, of how pressure is changing over distance, what we do is we normalize everything to sea level. So when we take a look at surface maps of, that have isobars on them, these are, actually, these are actually pressure values that have been all adjusted to mean sea level. And so what we're taking a look at are sea level pressures. And so what we see here is a surface pressure map, in this case for 18Z on the 11th of January 2004. Here's the sea level pressure map for the exact same time. So mathematically what we do is we basically calculate pressure adjusted to mean sea level for all locations and then we plot pressure basically for this horizontal plane for mean sea level. So even though we have a lot of variation in elevation across the United States and across all of our land surfaces on the planet, in order for us to actually get a good idea of how pressure is actually varying, we basically will adjust to this horizontal plane at the surface. We'll call it surface even though it's mean sea level. So when I talk about surface maps in our class, basically everything that we're looking at in terms of temperature and dew points and winds, all of that is actually what's being measured at the surface. But when we represent pressure with isobars, all of that is going to be adjusted to mean sea level as we see on this right-hand map. Now the reason that we adjust to mean sea level when we're talking about pressure is because we need to see how pressure varies on a horizontal surface in order to actually be able to understand the forces that actually govern our winds at the surface. So here is, for example, a map of the upper Midwest and we have some station models on this map. And by the way, if you are not familiar with station models, you can go into our text and I think in chapter one, there is a fairly good discussion about station models. So here are station models in the upper Midwest, and here is <clears throat> what the surface map looks like for the exact same time. So we have a couple of highs and a couple of lows on this map. These highs and lows, and then the isobars that surround them are all determined by looking at pressures at mean sea level. So these are all the pressures at mean sea level. So imagine that the Earth is just a horizontal plane, and that horizontal plane is at sea level. These are the pressures that we would find at sea level, even though on our land surfaces, in fact, almost all of these locations are above sea level. And what you see is that we have a lot of isobars surrounding that low that's centered over the Minnesota-Wisconsin border. Uh, we have a weaker low off the Pacific Northwest coast, and then we have a couple of areas of weak high pressure in the Four Corners area and just off the coast of Maine. Now, in this class, when I teach it face-to-face, -face, I actually have the students do a lot of analysis where I actually have them plot maps given station models, and I actually have them plot isobars and isotherms. Now, this course is designed for distance, and I don't have students actually turning in maps so I can grade their analyzed maps, but I still expect you to be able to analyze maps and to actually be able to draw iso lines on a map. So what we're going to do here is going to give you some instructions on how it is you draw iso lines on a map given data. 
And we're gonna talk a little bit more about data in a few minutes, but let me just give you these instructions to begin with. So here are the rules when you're analyzing and plotting ISO lines on a map. Now an ISO line is a line where on that line, the value whatever it is you're analyzing is exactly the same. So an isobar is a line where the pressure is identical or is the same everywhere on that line. Equal pressure, equal isobar pressure. All right, so isotherm, it would be a line of equal temperature. So we're taking a look at isobars. The contour interval for isobars on a map is four millibars. Now you don't get to choose what your base value of an isobar is. The values are actually chosen for you. The base is 1,000 millibars, and you go up and down from 1,000 millibars in four increments, and increments of four. So from 1,000 to 1,004, 1,008, 1,012, all the way up to 1,048, 1,052, 1,056, and so on. Going down, 996, 992, 988, all the way down to 976, 972, and so on. So the values during, of which you're going to draw on a map are defined for you. Now you're only going to draw the isobars that correspond to the pressure values that are on the map. So you wouldn't draw a 982 millibar isobar if all of the pressure values on the map were greater than 982. Similarly, you wouldn't choose, you wouldn't draw a 1,040 millibar isobar if all the values were less than 1,040 millibars. So you just draw the isobars that correspond to the actual values that are on the map, but you have to choose from these specific values. So in better words, there's never going to be an 1,001 millibar isobar or a 994. They always have to be these values. The contour should be smooth, no jagged edges. So you can see on this map that all of these contours are nice and smooth and there are no jagged edges. The shapes of the adjacent contours are usually pretty similar. So you can see, for example, going out from the center of this high, that while the shapes gradually change as you move outward, the shapes are pretty similar from one isobar to the next. So the shapes of the adjacent con contours are pretty similar. Different contours may not intersect. So take a look right here. You can see there's 1,000 millibars crossing through southern Indiana, 1,004 millibars just going to the south of that. If you had the 1,000 and 1,004 millibar isobars actually crossing each other, at that point where the two isobars are crossing, that basically says to you that the value of the atmospheric pressure at that point is both 1,000 and 1,004 millibars. That's like saying that you weigh 115 and 125 pounds at the same time. You only have one weight, and at every location on the Earth's surface, the atmosphere only has one weight as well. So isobars are not allowed to intersect. <clears throat> Make sure that you always label your isobar values. Otherwise, it's really, really hard to remember what the values of these lines are. So you can see here that all of these isobars are analyzed and, and values are actually given to them. So make sure that you actually assign values to your isobars and you write them out. Okay, finally, do not draw iso lines or contours where no data exists. This is typically over areas that are large bodies of water, or sometimes if we're taking a look at the U.S., we'll see that over Mexico and Canada, we don't actually have data for our maps. So you only draw ISO lines where you have data. You do not extend your ISO lines over areas where you do not have data to analyze. And so these are the basic rules that you need when you're drawing ISO lines. Okay, so here's an example of a nice simple map where I've drawn a couple of isotherms. So the numbers on this map are temperatures. Now, I apologize, I actually did not put values on these isolines, but if we take a look and we just go to the far north here, you can see that to the north of this isotherm, our temperatures are below zero Fahrenheit, and to the south of them, they're above zero Fahrenheit. So this is the zero degree Fahrenheit isotherm. And what you'll see here is that the isotherm, first of all, does a really good job of organizing the data. It makes sure that all values less than zero are on one side, all values greater than zero are on the other side, so the isotherm itself is the actual value, in this case, zero degrees Fahrenheit. You'll see also that I only drew this isotherm over those areas where I have data. And you can see this is basically a map of the central and eastern U.S. where I have data. No data over the western U.S., no data over Canada. 
So I only draw the isotherm where I have data. Now, for this particular map, and this is the case with isotherms, the contour interval for isotherms is 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's just every 10 degrees. So in this case, 0 degrees, the next one's going to be 10 degrees. So the 10 degree isotherm is basically going to basically be drawn where we have lower values to the north, higher values to the south. Now, the other thing I want to say here is you'll notice that on this map that we really don't have many locations. As a matter of fact, we don't have we only have one location where the temperature is actually 10 degrees. And so you still have to draw your 10 degree isotherm even though you don't have locations indicated where it's 10 degrees. And so you have to interpolate. You have to interpolate between values that are less than 10 degrees and values that are greater than 10 degrees, and you draw the isotherm between them. Now, you'll see that between 3 and 16, Basically, you have 7 degrees between 3 and 10, and 6 degrees between 10 and 16, and so the isotherm pretty much splits the difference. But you'll see between 16 and 9 that I've drawn the isotherm a lot closer to 9 than 16, because 10 is a lot closer to 9 than it is to 16. So basically, you're going to interpolate. Again, you're going to basically follow where we have data. You're going to interpolate, and then you're not going to draw any further than where you have data. You don't draw the isotherm where you do not have data. I've drawn one little isotherm here, another little 10 right here, to indicate that we have this one little area where we have values less than 10. Our next isotherm is going to be 20. And again, we're going to interpolate, and this is going to be between values that are less than 20 to the north and greater than 20 to the south. And so here is our 20 degree isotherm. Now you can keep going. And you can see, if you take a look at our map, you'll see that the highest temperature on this map is 73. So the highest value isotherm that we're going to draw is going to be the 70 degree isotherm, and it's just going to be right here. So here's our, again, here is our 20 degree isotherm. That means you have to draw a 30, a 40, a 50, a 60, and a 70 degree isotherm. I will note, and I did not put this in my rules in the previous slide, that you're not allowed to skip isotherms. So, for example, because the highest value is 70, you can't just say, okay, I'm going to draw the 20, 30, 50, and 70. You still have to draw the 40 and 60 degree isotherms. So you're not allowed to skip values. You've got to draw an isotherm for every set of values that's on the map from our lowest to our highest. The same goes for isobars on a pressure map. Okay, so I'm going to actually get out of the slideshow now because I want to actually do a little bit of drawing just to show you how this is done. So I'm going to go out of the slideshow. I'm going to go full screen here. I'm going to make this a little bit larger. I'm going to do some drawing. Now I want to keep, I want to be clear here that I'm drawing with PowerPoint, which is not the greatest way in the world to draw. If you want, you can actually go into the exercises, find some maps, and print them off and sketch with a pencil not a pen. All right, sketch with a pencil so that you can erase if you think you're making a mistake or you want to try over again. Also, you're welcome to print a map multiple times. It's one of the great things about having an e-text versus a hard copy text is that you've got the files electronically and you can keep printing if you want to keep trying. So I'm going to go to draw. I'm going to come right here. Come on. There's my pen color. I'm going to make it dark because we've got We've got red right here. Now what I'm going to do, and what you should do when you actually are drawing ISO lines on a map, is that you should look for a really high or a really low value and start with an extreme and work your way towards the middle. So what I'm going to do here on this temperature map is I'm going to start where it's hottest. And you can see there are a couple of, a couple of locations in South Texas that are warmer than 90 degrees. So here is my 90 degree isotherm. Now, what I want you to notice right off the bat is that I'm not drawing over Mexico and I'm not drawing over the Gulf of Mexico. I'm only drawing over South Texas because that's where I have data. And I'm interpolating between the 80s to the north and the 90s to the south. <clears throat> now, you'll notice also that I've got a lot of warm air in, in Florida. So let's talk about our 80 degree isotherm next. So just eye things before you begin to draw. You'll see we have a couple of 80s in Texas. We've got a lot of 80s in the Deep South, and we've got 80s in Florida. You'll also notice we have a couple of coastal locations along the Atlantic coast in Florida where we have temperatures less than 80. So let's take a look and see how we draw this. So I'm going to start in South Texas again. 
and I'm going to go basically to the north of that 85. So I'm going to I'm going to interpolate, and then I'm going to come down right here to the 81. Now I could actually take this to the Gulf Coast, but the right thing to do is actually to begin heading up into East Texas and Louisiana, and go up into Arkansas, and then begin to cut back down again. So what I'm doing is I'm keeping all of the, of the locations where the temperature is greater than 80 inside of that isotherm or to the south of the isotherm. So I'm going to continue down now into Mississippi, over to Alabama. We actually have a nice 80 right on the Alabama-Georgia border. And then I'm going to begin to cut south into Florida. And we have another 80 just south of Tampa. And they're going to cut east again, basically taking us into the Atlantic a little bit, into the Caribbean. And there we are. That's it. Just going to the Bahamas. And so that's it for the 80 degree isotherm. So I didn't go any further east than where I had data. I didn't draw anything in the Gulf of Mexico. I get everything that is warmer than 80 to the south and inside of this isotherm, everything cooler in the 70s to the north. Now I'm going to draw one more. I'm going to draw the 70 degree isotherm. Now you'll see that we have an expansive area in the 70s in the southern and eastern United States. So I'm going to again start in Texas and I'm going to start right here. I'm going to work my way up to the 70 in the Texas Panhandle. Come between the 68 and the 75, the 68 and the 70 right here along the Kansas uh, Missouri uh, border. We have another 70 in Missouri. Here's a 71, which I believe is in St. Louis. We then start heading north again in Indiana. We've got a 79 in Columbus, while well, we have a 56 right on the Indiana-Ohio border. 68 in Pittsburgh, 77 in, I can't remember what city that is in West Virginia. We come up to Williamsport in Pennsylvania. Binghamton in New York down to Philly, and we're done. And there's our 70 degree isotherm. So this is how you draw it. Now, I'm not gonna draw any more here, so I'm just gonna tell you that what you need to do is you need to look at the rest of the map. Look for your coldest value on the map. And you're gonna see it's a 30 right here. Now I'm gonna give you a little hint here. You're not gonna draw a 30 degree isotherm here. And by the way, we have a couple of upper 20s in Canada. But you're not going to draw a 30 degree isotherm here because it's one point that's 30 degrees. Your lowest or your coldest isotherm that you're going to draw in the west is going to be a 40 degree isotherm. And you're going to have all these, the, all these locations that are in the 30s inside of your 40 degree isotherm. The only 30 degree isotherm that you're going to draw is going to be in Canada. So let's just draw this and this will be the last thing I do. I'm going to draw it so I keep everything that is in the 20s down to around 30 inside of this isotherm. And here it is, and I'm done. So this is the only 30 degree isotherm that we're gonna have on the map. Now keep in mind that we have the 70 degree isotherm cutting through the Ohio Valley and the Mid-Atlantic. So we're still gonna to have to have a 60 and a 50 and a 40 degree isotherm in here, cutting through this area. So I hope this gives you some idea of how to do it. Obviously, you need to mark these things, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that now because I just have to start creating text boxes, and I want to keep moving through this PowerPoint. <clears throat> okay, so that's what I'm going to do with our drawing. I'm going to go back to the slideshow, and I'm going to go from our current slide. So there we are. Let's keep moving forward. If we take a look at surface maps, and we take a look at mean sea level pressure, Often what we'll see is that our sea level pressure patterns orient themselves in quasi-circles around centers of high and low pressure. But if you look carefully, what you'll also see is that the isobars do something that I like to call kinking. So you'll see a little bit of kinking on the isobars right here, here, and here, and here going north of the high, and the same thing going from northeast to southwest of the low. You'll see this kinking in the isobars. And you'll notice this kind of serrated line that's drawn through the kinking around the high, that goes through the high, and this dashed line that's drawn through the kinking of the isobars that goes right through the center of the low. 
So ridges correspond to this serrated line right here. So this kinking and the line that actually connects the kinks in the isobars surrounding the high is called a ridge. So ridges are basically axes of relatively high pressure. On the other hand, this dashed line that basically connects the kinks in the isobars that surround low pressure, these are called troughs. So this is an axis of lower pressure. So you can actually tell, I'm gonna actually say a little bit more about this before I move on to the next map. You can actually tell that the ridge is an axis of high pressure by basically just drawing a line that is perpendicular to the ridge axis or just goes kind of tangent to the isobar where the kink is right here. And what you'll see is that the value of pressure at R basically is one, is one value, but as you move out from that R, from that ridge, to point C and D, what you'll see is that the value of the pressure actually decreases out towards C, out towards D. The isobar at the highest value is going to be right here near the center of the high, and then these isobars that move outward from the high are going to have diminishing values in increments of four. So whatever this value of the ridge is right here at point R, as you move outward towards point C and D, you're moving outwards towards the isobar that has a lower value, and so the pressure is decreasing. And so right on the ridge axis, at this point, the, the pressure has a maximum value relative to what it is on either side of the ridge axis. Conversely, if we take a look at our trough, and we have our point T right on the axis of the trough, if we draw a line that's perpendicular to the trough axis or tangent to the isobar, what you'll see, given that the, the lowest value isobar surrounds the low and that the values of the isobars increase as we move outward from the low, what you see is that as we move outward from point T towards points A and B is that the pressure value is increasing. So the pressure is increasing towards the value of the next outward isobar from the low center. And so you can do this basically at every point along these kinks on these isobars and you'll find the same detail. And that is that the lowest pressure is on the kink and the pressures increase outward along the perpendicular to the trough axis. And so troughs are always axes of lower pressure and ridges are always axes of higher pressure. Now the highest pressure is always going to be at the center of the high. The lowest pressure is always going to be at the center of the low. But what this kinking does with ridges and troughs is it basically indicates that we have values that are bulging outward. In the case of the ridge, we have higher pressures bulging outward from the high center. In the case of the trough, we have lower pressures bulging outward from the center of the trough. Now in real world surface maps, where we, what we typically see is that the kinking is more accentuated with lows than it is of highs. You typically don't see as dramatic a ridge as you will a trough in terms of the kinking of the isobars. <clears throat> now, what we see in, in the real world with small, with small scale motions is that, is that we always get motion towards lower pressure from higher pressure. So for example, if you consider a glass of water, so say you have a glass of water on the table right by you as you're watching this video. If that glass suddenly disappeared, all the water would just flow outward in all directions from where that glass used to be. That's because water has greater density than air, and so at the bottom of your glass of water, the total weight of the atmosphere plus out water is greater than just the atmospheric weight on your tabletop surrounding your glass of water. And so the water flows from higher to lower weight, higher to lower pressure. So the question is, when we're looking at large scale motions in the atmosphere, and now I'm getting ready to start the process of developing wind fields. And so if we take a look at wind fields, the question is, does that motion, does that fluid motion in the atmosphere simply blow directly from high to low pressure? So we've got a couple of highs and lows here on this colored map, and you can see we have a high off the coast of California and another one in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific High, the Bermuda High, and then we have a couple of areas of low pressure off the Aleutians and over or just east or west of Iceland, so the Aleutian and Icelandic lows. So do we get flow directly from high to low pressure? And the answer is no. 
In fact, when we take a look at our circulations around centers of high and low pressure, we're going to find that in fact, while the air does generally move from higher to lower pressure, it takes a circuitous route and we'll find that our winds actually cross isobars at an angle from higher to lower pressure. And so what we're going to find, and I'm going to show this to you now, is that winds at the surface result from a balance between multiple forces that are simultaneously acting on the air. Now we're going to take a look at three forces in particular in this PowerPoint, but there are more than that. I'm just going to look at three because it really gets the job done for us. So we're going to look at three forces moving into these next couple of slides. The first one is a pressure gradient force, the second one is a Coriolis force, and the third one is friction. And you've heard most likely of all three of these forces. So what we're going to do in the upcoming slides is just to show you how these three forces act on air and then give us the wind circulations that we observe at the Earth's surface. Okay, so let's start with the pressure gradient force. The pressure gradient force is basically a measure of how it is that the atmosphere forces motion given that pressure changes over distance. So what I'm going to do here is just illustrate, and this is straight from your text, I'm going to illustrate basically how it is that the pressure gradient force causes fluid to move over a small scale. So this is kind of analogous to that glass of water example that I just gave you a minute ago. But in this case, we, have a, we basically have a tank, and we have a, we have a divider between the tank, and we have colored water. So we have blue water on the left, and we have blue water on the right, but the heights are different. So the weight of the atmosphere plus this water on the left is greater than the weight of the atmosphere plus this water on the right. Now you know, you already know that when this divider is removed, that the water is going to flow from the left to the right tank. And this is because the weight on the left-hand side is greater and it's this pressure difference, this pressure gradient, pressure difference over distance that's going to force the water to move from left to right. And that force is the pressure gradient force. So I'm going to start, I'm going to start this up now and we're going to lift the divider. By the way, that's not my hand. That is probably the hand of one of our authors. So as the divider is lifted, obviously you're going to see the water is going to begin to flow from left to right. And as long as there is a pressure difference from left to right, the water is going to flow from higher to lower pressure. And this motion is going to continue until the height of the water on both sides is equal. So when the divider is totally removed and the tank has basically water on the same height on each side, that means the pressure in each tank is identical. And so the pressure gradient, that pressure difference over distance disappears and the motion disappears. Now, I just want to say as we move forward through this description of forces, that the pressure gradient force is the force that always initiates the motion. The pressure gradient force is the only force that can move on the fluid that is not in motion. The other two forces, friction and the Coriolis force, can only be active when the fluid or the air is in motion. So the pressure gradient force is the force that gets things going. It's the force that can again act on fluid that's not in motion and it actually gets things moving. Now when we have a fluid that's in motion in the context of the atmosphere, treating the atmosphere as a fluid, moving atmosphere is simply a fancy way of saying wind. So when the atmosphere is in motion, we have a wind. So the pressure gradient force is the force that triggers the motion that gives us our wind. And again, the motion is always going to be from high to low pressure. But obviously, as I said a slide ago, <clears throat> the pressure gradient force is not the only force that acts on the air. So our wind is simply not determined by the pressure gradient force alone. So if we actually want to understand how it is that we get motion that crosses isobars at an angle from high to low pressure, we need to consider more forces. And that's going to take us to our Coriolis force in a moment. But just to give you an idea of what we see on the surface map, you can see that our winds are not moving straight from high to low pressure. We have a high over Montana, we have a low to the north of Lake Superior, and you can see that in fact our winds are crossing the isobars at an angle from high to low pressure versus straight from high to low. Not only that, I want to point out that wind speed itself is proportional to the magnitude of pressure gradient force 
or the rate at which pressure changes over distance. <clears throat> so where our isobars are packed relatively close together, that means that pressure is changing relatively rapidly over distance, and our pressure gradient is large, our pressure gradient force is large, and we have relatively strong winds. If we see that there's a very large distance separating adjacent isobars like we have here in the deep south and over the Gulf of Mexico, that means that the rate at which pressure is changing over distance is really small, our pressure gradient force is small, and so the force that actually pushes the air along is small, and we're gonna have much lighter winds, and what we can see here for a station model is that the winds are calm. No wind direction line or barbs or flags off of the end of our, our wind direction line. So this concentric circle around our station model simply indicates that the winds are calm. All right, let's move on to the Coriolis force. So I have shamelessly stolen a couple of images of Bart and Homer Simpson looking at a toilet in Springfield on the left and in Australia on the right. This is a very, very old episode of The Simpsons. But basically, the point of this episode, in, in this part of the episode, is basically when the Simpsons go to Australia, they get homesick. And one of the things that the U.S. Embassy does is it hooks up this apparatus to make the water flow down the toilet in a counterclockwise manner rather than clockwise. So a lot of people have this notion that the counterclockwise swirl of water down a drain, whether it's a toilet or a sink, is caused by the Coriolis force. But in fact, it is actually not caused by the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force, which actually does act on air to cause it to rotate about an axis, the Coriolis force actually only acts on motions at really large scales. This rotation that we see here in this cartoon is actually caused by something that is much more small scale, but is not the Coriolis force. Probably much more to do with the geometry of the actual basin that we're looking at here. So let's talk about the Coriolis force in a bit more detail. It's an apparent deflection of large scale motions. So I put apparent in, in quotation signs because it turns out that the Coriolis force is not a real force. Whereas the pressure gradient force is a real force where the air is actually being pushed from higher to lower pressure, the Coriolis force actually appears to cause deflection, but it's not a real force. I'll explain why in just a few moments. But first of all, it's caused by the rotational dependence of the Earth's radial velocity. So if you think about the Earth spinning about its axis once every 24 hours, it doesn't depend, it doesn't matter whether you're at the equator or standing here in Bowling Green or at the North Pole, no matter where you are, you're going to be going around a circle once every 24 hours. But because the Earth is a sphere, what we see is that the circle that surrounds the planet at the equator is substantially larger than the circle that's going around the Earth at Bowling Green, which is about 41 degrees latitude. And it's much smaller at, say, 60 or 65 degrees north in Canada when you go around the latitude line there. And by the time you get to the North Pole, you don't even have a line of latitude. At the North Pole, at 90 degrees north, you're basically just standing on a point and you're turning once every 24 hours. So depending on what latitude you're at, the speed at which you need to go around your circle is going to depend on that actual latitude. So if you're at the equator, you actually have to go around a circle that has a circumference of about 25,000 miles once every 24 hours. If you're in Bowling Green, the circle that you go around is a good bit smaller, and so even though you're going around it once every 24 hours, your speed or your radial velocity is smaller. And by the time you get to the North Pole and you're just standing on a point, your radial velocity is actually zero. So it turns out that the Earth's radial velocity is latitude dependent. It decreases from its maximum at the equator to its minimum of zero at the North and the South Poles. At the equator, it turns out that your radial velocity or your sideways velocity, which is basically from west to east, is 100, it's 1,036 miles per hour. So you're going really, really fast. You just don't realize it because everything around you is moving from west to east at exactly the same speed. If you're sitting or standing here in Bowling Green, the radial velocity is just a little under 780 miles per hour. And again, by the time you get to the North Pole, that radial velocity has decreased to zero. 
So if you are a volume of air and you're moving around from north to south or around the globe somehow, it turns out that the radial velocity of the planet beneath you is always changing as you make these large scale motions around the globe or you know, from one point to some point much further away. So, so again, I'm going to leave this rating up and what I'm going to do is just talk about this example where we have the Earth and basically what we have is our direction of rotation. So the Earth is rotating about its axis and basically our motion, if we're just taking a look at the planet from outer space, is from west to east. Now if we were to take a projectile, just imagine hitting a golf ball as hard as you possibly can at the equator, and you actually hit that golf ball as hard as you can towards the North Pole. What happens if you actually are able to hit it and actually would it somehow be able to go a really great distance, the golf ball, once it actually leaves the, the Earth at the equator, the golf ball doesn't just have the speed that is going towards the North Pole because you've hit it with your club. The golf ball also has the radial velocity of the planet at the equator, the sideways velocity of 1,036 miles per hour. However, because the golf ball is no longer in contact with the Earth's surface, the golf ball doesn't realize that the Earth is slowing down beneath it. So while the radial velocity of the Earth beneath the golf ball is decreasing, the golf ball maintains the radial velocity of the Earth at the equator. And so what happens is it appears to deflect off to the east, in this case to the right of its initial motion. So the golf ball is actually not being pushed to the east or to the right of its initial motion. The golf ball is moving to the east of its initial motion because the Earth beneath it is slowing down in terms of its radial velocity. This is why the Coriolis force isn't a real force, it's an apparent force, because nothing is actually pushing that golf ball off towards the right. Now you can take that golf ball and put it up here in the North Pole and do exactly the same thing. You can hit it as hard as you can towards the equator, and what you would see is that as the golf ball, which has zero radial velocity now because it's at the North Pole, as the golf ball heads from the North Pole towards the equator, it still is going to maintain its zero radial velocity because it's not in contact with the Earth beneath it. And so while the radial velocity of the Earth begins to increase west to east, the golf ball has no radial velocity. And so the Earth will begin to zip off beneath the golf course golf ball west to east, but the golf ball has zero radial velocity, and so it will appear to veer off like this, follow my cursor, like this. So imagine the arrow is now pointing towards the south and the west, and again what you'll see is that the deflection is toward the right of the initial motion of the golf ball, which is straight north to south. So this deflection, which is an apparent force caused by the changing radial velocity of the Earth beneath the object in the northern hemisphere always causes the object to be deflected to the right of its initial motion. Now you could do the same thing in the southern hemisphere and you'll find that the deflection is always to the left of the initial motion. Now in order to get the left and right correctly you have to basically aim yourself down these arrows and basically look down the arrow from the tail of the arrow towards the head of the arrow and then put your arms out left and right. And then you'll be able to figure out the left and right sides of these arrows. I call them vectors. All right, so you'll see that the deflection is to the right of the vector in the northern hemisphere and to the left of the vector in the southern hemisphere. All right, so let's actually give some rules now for the Coriolis force. The Coriolis force always acts 90 degrees to the right of the wind in the northern hemisphere. It always acts 90 degrees to the left of the wind in the southern hemisphere. The Coriolis force increases with wind speed. In better words, the amount of deflection increases as the wind speed increases because the rate at which the radial velocity beneath the moving air is going to change, that change is going to increase as the wind speed increases. And you cannot deflect motion with the Coriolis force if the wind is calm because the radial velocity beneath that calm volume of air will remain a constant. So the Coriolis force is zero when the air is calm and the magnitude of the deflection, the magnitude of the Coriolis force increases as the wind speed increases. So for a given wind speed, 
And this is kind of this is kind of not really going to be covered in our class, but I'm just kind of giving it to you for a little bit of completeness. But for a given wind speed, the Coriolis force is zero at the equator, and its magnitude increases with latitude. All right. Now, what I want to do next is I want to talk about how it is that the air responds when both the pressure gradient and Coriolis forces are able to act upon that air. So what I'm going to be giving you now is a sequence of events, and this is how things work. What is really helpful, I find, for students is to imagine that, that, you're play, that you have a tug of war going on, and you've got two teams that are playing a tug of war, and that little, that little piece of fabric in the middle is the air. All right, so think about the tug of war, that little piece of fabric is the air. Now, each of the sides is going to represent a force. So one side is going to be the pressure gradient force, the other side is going to be the Coriolis force. When we begin this tug of war, there's going to be no Coriolis force because we're going to start with air that is still. All right, so at the beginning, what's going to happen is the pressure gradient side of this, of this tug of war is just going to basically be dragging the, dragging the rope along. And what's going to happen with time is that people are going to begin to pick up the rope on the Coriolis force side. One by one, we're going to add people until the number of people on each side is equal and they're pulling equally and that, that piece of towel in the middle stops moving. So it's initially going to be moving with the pressure gradient force toward the pressure gradient force. The Coriolis force is eventually going to stop that movement towards the pressure gradient force and eventually everything is going to come into balance. Now, in the context, context of the air, we're going to serve as still air, and the pressure gradient force is going to initiate the wind. Remember, the pressure gradient force is the only force that can act on air that is calm or not in motion. Now, if you take a look down here at our colored vectors, our pressure gradient force vector is going to be colored red. Our Coriolis force, when it kicks in, is going to be colored green. And the direction of motion, which is the wind, or V, is going to be colored black. Now, the pressure gradient force is always going to be directed perpendicular to the isobars from higher to lower pressure. Here's our pressure gradient force vector. The wind is initially going to move in the same direction as the pressure gradient force because the pressure gradient force is the only force that can act on the air, so the, so the wind is going to just basically begin to move in the same direction, in this case from south to north. Now, as soon as the wind begins to blow, the Coriolis force vector is going to kick in, this green vector, and it's going to act 90 degrees to the right of our wind vector. So here is our Coriolis force vector. Now what you'll notice here is that the two forces acting on the air are not equal. The pressure gradient force is larger than the Coriolis force, and so what's going to happen is the pressure gradient force side of the tug of war is going to continue to drag things along. But now we've got the Coriolis force beginning to kick in here and act 90 degrees to the right of the wind. Now, this is where things differ a little bit from an actual tug of war. What happens in the atmosphere is that what the, what the wind is going to do is it's going to try and strike a balance between these two forces. Now you can see right off the bat that the magnitude of the forces is small, or it's, or it's different. So the Coriolis force is still small. So as the wind tries to strike a balance, what it's going to do is, number one, it's going to accelerate, and that's going to cause the Coriolis force magnitude to increase because the Coriolis force gets bigger as the wind speed increases, and the direction of the wind is going to try and split the difference between these two forces. And you can see this at some point later right here where my cursor is, is basically circling. So this is kind of like time two. Time one here on the left, time two here where I'm circling. So the wind's going to accelerate, and it's going to begin to turn to the right to begin to strike a balance between the pressure gradient and Coriolis forces. And this is going to continue. So the wind is going to continue to accelerate, and it's going to continue to turn to the right as our Coriolis force increases in magnitude. And eventually what will happen is we'll reach that balance, where when we're playing a tug of war, we've got equal force pulling on both sides, and the rag or the towel in the middle just stays where it is. So in the context of the atmosphere, we actually reach our balance, we achieve our balance when the magnitudes uh, the pressure gradient and Coriolis forces are identical, and the directions in which they're acting are opposite. So now what we have is our pressure gradient and Coriolis force vectors of equal magnitude pointing in opposite directions, and the wind right here, this wind is actually representing a balance between the pressure gradient 
and Coriolis forces. And this, is, this wind gets a very particular or special name. It's called the geostrophic wind. The geostrophic wind is the wind that results from a balance between the pressure gradient and Coriolis forces. Characteristics of the geostrophic wind. Number one, it's always parallel to the isobars. It always blows parallel to the isobars. It always blows with low pressure to its left of the arrow. So again, to figure out which side is left, you put yourself at the tail of the vector, you look down towards the arrowhead, and then you move your arms outward. And so you can see that low pressure is to the left of the wind vector, high pressure is to the right of the geostrophic wind vector. So the geostrophic wind flows always parallel to the, to the isobars with low pressure on its left, high pressure on its right. Now, the geostrophic wind is not the real wind. We're not at friction yet, and we know that friction is a thing at the surface. So we've not talked about friction and its impacts yet, and there are, uh, there are still other forces besides friction that also impact the wind. But the reality is that the geostrophic wind is a really nice first approximation of the forces causing the wind to blow at the surface, and it explains about 80 to 85% of the real wind that we observe. So the geostrophic wind is a really nice, simple model of the wind that results from a balance between the pressure gradient and Coriolis forces. And so if we take a look at the geostrophic wind around a center of low pressure, centered right here along the Kansas-Oklahoma border, what I'm going to do is I'm first going to draw the pressure gradient and Coriolis forces at four points surrounding this low, and then I'm going to put in the geostrophic wind. So here are our pressure gradient forces. You'll notice that in all four locations, here, 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 and here, the pressure gradient force vector is directed perpendicular to the isobars and directed straight in towards that center of low pressure. All right, so here are our pressure gradient force vectors. Now the Coriolis force vectors, when we have balance, are gonna be directed in the exact opposite direction and of equal magnitude, equal length. So here are our Coriolis force vectors. Now, in order to figure out the direction of the wind, we know if the wind is going to be geostrophic, it's going to be blowing parallel to these isobars. But the question is, for example, in which direction is it going to be parallel? So if we take our location in North Texas, is the wind going to be a west wind blowing west to east, or is the wind going to be an east wind blowing east to west? Now, in order to get this correct, what you need to know is that the Coriolis force is always 90 degrees to the wind vector. So if the wind vector is blowing from west to east, in better words, it's directed towards the east, the Coriolis force vector will be 90 degrees to the right of our wind vector. So here are our geostrophic wind vectors. And if you take a look at each one of these vectors, at each of these four locations, what you'll see is that the Coriolis force is 90 degrees to the right of our geostrophic wind vector. And the geostrophic wind is basically blowing parallel to the isobars. So here's our geostrophic wind around the center of low pressure. Now, if I actually get rid of the forces so that we can just see the wind vectors, what you'll see is that our geostrophic wind blows counterclockwise and parallel to the isobars around the center of low pressure. That's actually pretty good because in reality, the wind circulations around centers of low pressure is counterclockwise. But as I told you several minutes ago, the actual wind circulation isn't just counterclockwise, but as I said before, the wind crosses the isobars at an angle toward lower pressure. So we're not quite all the way there yet. But again, the geostrophic wind gets us pretty far along. The geostrophic wind allows us to see that we have a counterclockwise wind circulation around centers of low pressure. <clears throat> Let's consider high pressure. Now we have a fairly expansive area of high pressure over the Ohio Valley. I'm gonna take a look at four locations surrounding our center of high pressure. And again, I'll start with the pressure gradient force, then I'll put in the Coriolis force, and then put in the geostrophic wind. Here are our pressure gradient forces now. Now, instead of them pointing directly in towards the center of low pressure, they're pointing straight out from the center of high pressure towards lower pressure. The pressure gradient force is still crossing the isobars at a 90 degree angle. The magnitude still is determined by the distance separating the isobars, but you'll see here that the pressure gradient force is always directed outward towards lower pressure. 
When I put in the Coriolis force, again, what we're going to see are that the magnitude is going to be equal and they're going to be pointing in opposite directions. So in this case, the Coriolis force is basically directed in towards the center of our high pressure. Again, perpendicular, pretty much perpendicular to the isobars. They didn't do a great job here in Pennsylvania, but perpendicular to the isobars. We again are left with the situation of having to determine whether or not the winds are blowing in one direction or the other based on the fact that they're going to be parallel to the isobars in all four of these locations. To get the wind direction correct, again, the winds are going to have to be oriented such that the Coriolis force is 90 degrees to the right of those wind vectors. So I'm going to put in the wind vectors now, and there they are for the geostrophic wind. And so if you take a look at all four, lo all four locations for our geostrophic wind, you will see that the Coriolis force is exactly 90 degrees to the right of the wind vector. Furthermore, if you take a look at our geostrophic wind vectors, you'll see that they're blowing parallel to our isobars with lower pressure on the left, higher pressure on the right. And if we get rid of our force vectors so you can just see our geostrophic wind, what you'll see now is that our geostrophic wind circulation around a center of high pressure is parallel and clockwise. And again, this is pretty good because wind circulations around centers of high pressure are clockwise. But again, we're not quite there because our winds cross the isobars at an angle from higher to lower pressure. So we don't have this angling of our winds toward lower pressure. So we still have some work to do. And that's what we're going to do next. So our next little bit of work is to add friction to the picture. And friction will get us where we need to be. <clears throat> so friction. Everybody knows what friction is. Friction always acts opposite the motion. So like the Coriolis force, you have to have motion for friction to exist. Friction is not going to slow something down if that thing, in this case the air, is not moving at all. So friction is another force that exists when we have motion. <clears throat> and it causes the following sequence. So order is important here. Number one, Friction is going to cause the speed of the geostrophic wind to decrease. Now, as soon as we introduce friction, the wind is no longer geostrophic because this geostrophic wind represents a balance between the pressure gradient and Coriolis forces. Once we introduce this third force, the wind ceases to be geostrophic. The ultimate wind that we're going to end up here is going to represent a balance between the pressure gradient, Coriolis, and friction forces. It's going to be a balance between three forces, but the wind ceases to be geostrophic. <clears throat> so the wind slows down. Number two, the Coriolis force is going to decrease because the, the size of the Coriolis force is proportional to the wind speed. So if the wind slows, the Coriolis force is going to decrease. That is going to make the pressure gradient force the dominant force. And as a result, the wind is going to turn towards the pressure gradient force. Now let's just go back a little bit here and let's just consider these first three steps. So we introduce friction. Friction Let's start with our initial geostrophic wind. Here's our pressure gradient force directed towards low pressure. The Coriolis force is equal and opposite. And the geostrophic wind blows per parallel to the isobars with lower pressure on its left, higher pressure on its right. As soon as we introduce friction, we add this fourth vector. Friction is always going to act exactly opposite the motion. As soon as we introduce friction, it causes the geostrophic wind to slow down. So I'm going to take a little slice off of the geostrophic wind right here. That's I. As soon as the geostrophic wind decreases, the Coriolis force is going to decrease. That's II. I'm going to take a slice off our Coriolis force. Now the pressure gradient force is in no way impacted by friction's existence. The pressure gradient force is simply a measure of the rate at which pressure changes over distance and friction has no impact on that whatsoever. So the pressure gradient force stays the same, and it becomes the biggest force. Now once the pressure gradient force becomes the dominant force, the wind gets tugged towards the pressure gradient force. In better words, in our tug of war, the pressure gradient force side becomes the strongest side. And so the air motion or the wind gets tugged a little bit towards the pressure gradient force. So you can see the wind turning towards the pressure gradient force, then the Coriolis force has to turn an equal amount to maintain its 90 degree angle with the wind, and friction has to turn an equal amount to maintain being opposite the actual wind. So what we see at the end of the day is that a wind basically turns towards a pressure gradient force, and here's our new balance. 
This wind represents a balance between the pressure gradient, Coriolis, and frictional forces. And what we see now is that the wind that results from a balance between these three forces is going to cross the isobars at an angle from higher towards lower pressure. In better words, it's going to be tugged a little bit towards the pressure gradient force because it's the dominant force. So let's go back to our examples of high and low pressure. We'll start with our low pressure. <clears throat> now I'm going to put all of our forces in now, starting with pressure gradient force. I believe I do Coriolis force next. Then I'm going to do, actually, I think, let me see how I do this. I can't even remember the order in which I do things. I know I put the pressure gradient force in first. So the pressure gradient force, again, directed in towards the center of the low, from higher to lower pressure, perpendicular to the isobars. The next vector that I put in is our wind vector. So at all four of these locations, the wind is going to cross the isobars at an angle from higher to lower pressure, and we're going to have a counterclockwise circulation. So here are our four wind vectors. You can see our counterclockwise circulation, and you can see the wind vector is angling in across the isobar from higher towards lower pressure. Not a huge angle, maybe a 30 degree angle. The angle varies from case to case and location to location, depending on wind speed and the roughness of the surface. So there's no special sauce to determine the angle at which the wind is crossing the isobars. The next vector I'm going to put in is going to be our Coriolis force vectors, where the Coriolis force is always going to be 90 degrees. No, I did friction next. Where friction is always opposite the wind. I apologize. Friction is always opposite the wind. I'm just getting my order bad here, but I'll get it right for the next time. And then finally, Coriolis force. Coriolis force always 90 degrees to the right of the wind vector. So again, pressure gradient force always directed inward. Our winds crossing the isobars at an angle from high to low pressure. Friction, always opposite the wind. Coriolis force, always 90 degrees to the right of our wind vector. If I remove all of our forces and you just see the wind vectors, what we end up with is a wind circulation that is counterclockwise and directed inward toward the center of the low. And this is exactly what we see at the surface. Our wind circulations around well-defined centers of low pressure are counterclockwise and inward directed. If I put the station models on this map and we just take a look at station model winds, you can see the counterclockwise and inward directed circulation around this center of low pressure. All right. Let's take a look at high pressure. And by the way, we are getting close to the end of this PowerPoint presentation. It feels like it's going long, and I think it is going long. So let's keep going. We're getting close to the end. All right, so here's our high pressure, again, centered broadly over the Ohio Valley. I'm going to start with our pressure gradient force pointing inward, pardon me, pointing outward in all four locations. Then I'm going to draw our geostrophic wind. So our geostrophic wind, or geostrophic wind, I apologize, our wind circulation. Our wind circulation is still going to be clockwise, but it's going to be directed outward from our high, from higher to lower pressure. So the wind now is going to be crossing the isobars at an angle from higher to lower pressure, but we're going to maintain our clockwise circulation. So here is our wind circulation around our center of high pressure. Friction then opposes our wind. Darn it, now I put in the Coriolis force next. The Coriolis force acts 90 degrees to the right of the wind. You can see it really, really well here. I'm gonna have to fix my animations before I make another video of this PowerPoint. And then friction, obviously it opposes the wind. So again, pressure gradient force, high, low. Wind crossing the isobar at an angle from higher to lower pressure. For Coriolis force 90 degrees to the right of all of our wind vectors and then friction opposing the wind. When I remove all of the force vectors, we end up with a wind circulation that is clockwise and directed outward from the center of the high. And this is exactly what we observe at the surface around well-developed centers of high pressure, clockwise and outward directed circulations. And here is the actual map with our station models and you can see, if you take a look at these station models, that our winds are clockwise and directed outward from the center of this high. All right, just a little bit more and then we're done. 
just for completeness so that I'm actually following the entire chapter. So question, why don't surface circulations cause highs and lows to disappear? If a high pressure center marks the maximum weight of a column of air and a low pressure center marks the minimum weight of a column of air, look at our circulations around high and low pressure. High pressure, clockwise and out. Low pressure, counterclockwise and in. If we take a look at high pressure, what this is telling us is that the winds should actually be removing mass from the column and the weight of the column should decrease. Conversely, because we're converging air at the center of our low pressure, counterclockwise and in, this should actually be adding to the mass of the column and causing the weight to increase so that our load disappears. Now what we see in the weather is that highs and lows actually don't just disappear very quickly. They actually mean they maintain themselves over a period of several days. And so if in fact we're adding mass at the center of a low and we're removing mass at the center of the high, something has to be going on above the surface to maintain our lows and highs at the surface. For high pressure, what we're going to see, and we're going to see this next week in chapter seven, what we're going to see of high pressure is that while we're removing mass at the surface, there's something going on higher up that's actually adding mass so that we can maintain our high at the surface. With low pressure, while in fact we do see that we're adding mass at the surface, which should cause the low to disappear, the reality is that above the low at the surface, there's something going on that's actually removing a lot of mass higher up, and that allows the entire column weight to remain low so we can have our low at the surface still. All right, next detail. And this has to do with movements of low pressure on a surface map over time. I'm not going to say a lot about this, but we use pressure tendencies to estimate system movement. Now here's the surface map, and to find pressure tendencies, you have to take a look at these little numbers right here, our pluses and minuses. This is how much pressure is changing at a location over a three-hour period. And this is coded, although to decode it, it's very simple. All you have to do is put a decimal point before the last number. So for example, this minus 19 means that this location right here in Mississippi, the pressure decreased by 1.9 millibars during the past three hours. They can see that further to the north and east, we've got larger values. Here's a minus 3.1, a minus 2.6. And what we see is that low pressure centers move over time to those locations that have the largest negative pressure tendencies. This is where pressure is decreasing most rapidly with time. So a center of low pressure will move to the location with the largest negative pressure tendencies. High pressure, which we actually don't have on this map, will move over time to those, to those locations that have the largest positive pressure tendencies. In better words, where pressure is increasing most rapidly with time. Okay, highs mark the center of air masses. We talk about air masses in weather and climate and weather studies laboratory and air mass marks the center of a large region where the temperature and the humidity characteristics are uniform. On the other hand, what we're going to see is that lows actually mark where we have fairly large changes in temperature and dew point and, and moisture characteristic. And this slide right here basically shows you how fronts are formed. So I think that in the text, these lines are meant to be isobars, but I think that it makes a much more sense for these lines to actually be isotherms. So here's a cold air mass, here's a warm air mass, and these lines represent isotherms. We have our coldest temperatures on the far west, our warmest temperatures on the far east, and then we have our clockwise and outward directed winds. And what you can see is that the, what the winds are doing is they're basically causing all of our isotherms to get packed together. Now, this frontal zone is referred to as a trough. It's a trough in temperatures, a relative low or minimum in temperatures. So we've got this frontal zone, this trough in temperatures. And what we see with fronts is that all of the isotherms tend to be relatively well packed right along the front. And in fact, fronts typically are the leading edge of this packed isotherm environment where we actually indicate the front by the advance or the retreat of these isotherms. So frontal formation theoretically occurs between two centers of high pressure. Now a cold front basically just represents a trough. So you can see the cold front is actually moving through this trough that extends from our center of low pressure 
going right through the kinks in the isobars. So here's a cold front that basically marks a trough between two centers of high pressure, where we have continental polar air on our northwesterly high and maritime tropical air on our southeasterly high, and the clockwise and outward directed circulations basically cause this convergence right along our front. Now, there are a couple of different ways that we can find fronts on maps. So I'm going to show you four maps here. This first map is a map of isotherms, and the isotherms basically are the contour interval here is every two degrees. Now, meteorologists typically use a contour interval of 10 degrees, but this will show the front really well. So if we take a look at a contour interval of 2, you can see right here the leading edge of this very large gradient in isotherms. And you can see we actually have another one that extends through southwest Pennsylvania and then goes southeast through Virginia and into the Atlantic Ocean. This is a cold front right here, and this is a warm front actually extending right here, even though it's not drawn on this particular graphic. So you can see the boundary that separates the cold air to the west and the warm air to the east right here with this cold front. And it is the leading edge of this thermal gradient. Our temperature, our dew point temperature map almost always mimics in some way, shape, or form our temperature map. So you can see the boundary in our dew point temperatures equally well as you can in temperatures. <clears throat> you can see our troughing in our isobars right here, and this trough actually marks the cold front. So typically fronts go right through the kinks in the isobars, right in the troughing through a low pressure center. And then you can see it in something called streamlines. Streamlines are a really useful tool that meteorologists use to show instantaneous motion or motion at a given point in time. And so this basically shows how the air is streaming along at that given time. And when we have a front, what you'll notice is that the streamlines will converge right along the front. And so you can see the cold front really, really well with these streamlines right here. So again, with temperature and dew point fields, the front basically marks the leading or the advancing edge of our lar very large gradients. With our isobaric field, our pressure field, the front is basically located right on the trough axis that goes through the kinks in our isobars. And then you can see in our streamline analysis that with our instantaneous flow, our front basically is located where the streamlines are converging very, very well along this line. Now, I will say that it's unusual in the real world to find a, an example that's this beautiful with converging streamlines along the front. It's typically, you can typically see it pretty well with well-defined fronts, but sometimes it's a little bit more diffuse and harder to identify and takes a bit more practice. All right, here is our lab assignment for chapter six. Remember this assignment is for my distance course. If you are taking my face-to-face -face course and you're watching this PowerPoint because you needed to make up for a lecture that you missed, just know that this is not the assignment for our face-to-face -face course. All right, a couple more things. And this again is for my distance students. A um, couple of examples of, of maps that you might actually want to practice drawing some isolines on. <clears throat> now this is a map where you actually have the option of drawing isotherms or isobars. Isotherms, you can draw for a 10, 10 uh, degree Fahrenheit contour interval, again, using zero numbers, 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. You can see our numbers here. This is a cold weather, this is a cold weather example. We have temperatures as low as 40 below zero right here in North Dakota, and our high temperatures are not terribly high, but on our southwest edge, you can see we have a couple of locations that are in the 20s. So you can draw isotherms starting with minus, I, I guess minus 30 would be your first one because our coldest temperature is minus 40. So going all the way from minus 30 to 20. You can also draw an isobaric analysis with our contour interval of four millibars. And you can see our pressures are coded right here in the upper right hand corner of our station models. If you've taken weather and climate or weather studies laboratory, you should know how to decode these pressures. If you don't know how to do it, here, is, here are some instructions. Here's an example that I actually show in my weather and climate class, and this is basically just a graphic with a sample station model. Here is our coded pressure on the upper right-hand side of our station model, and to decode this pressure, it depends on whether your number is less than or greater than 500. If the number is less than 500, you add a 10 in front of the code 
and a decimal point before the last digit. So 042 will be 1004.2 millibars. If the number is greater than 500, if the code is greater than 500, what you're going to do is you're going to add a 9 in front and then again place a decimal before the last digit. So in this case, if I give an example of 931, the actual pressure would be 993.1 millibars. And then the last example, this is an, iso this is an isothermal analysis. And this is a really nice example of a front that's crossing through the southeastern United States. So what you can do here is you can, again, you can draw your, your isotherms from highest to lowest or lowest to highest. It's up to you. Highest to lowest, lowest to highest, but you're going to use zero numbers. So our highest temperature on this map is, I believe, 73. So your largest value for your isotherm is going to be 70. The coldest temperature on this map, it looks like, is 21. So your lowest temperature isotherm is going to be 30. So you're going to draw 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70 degree isotherm. Now, once you draw your isotherms on this map, you'll be able to pick out packing in the isotherms. And you'll be able to pick out what is going to be a cold front on this particular map and where the cold front is located. You'll also notice that while you're drawing your isotherms, you'll also see that there's a really abrupt wind shift from southwest to northwest. So you can see really, really clearly where it is that the front is located on this map. Now, because it's a cold front, cold fronts indicate that the cold air is advancing and the cold front is going to be on the leading edge of these packed isotherms. And you're going to see that the leading edge of the packed isotherms, it turns out, is going to be pretty, mid, pretty much where you see this wind shift on the map. So again, for the distance students, go ahead and analyze this drawing isotherms and you'll be able to see the front really, really well. Now, you're not going to be drawing isotherms on any exams, either face-to-face -face or distance, but I will ask questions on the exam which will let me know whether or not you understand how it is these maps are analyzed and what it is that you're seeing. So go ahead, distance or face-to-face, -face, and do these maps. If you're doing face-to-face -face with me, you're going, to have to, you're going to have to analyze these maps anyway as part of your lab report. So anyway, I think that is just about it. It is. So I'm going to be done now. I'm going to end this PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to lower this. And when I'm done here, I'm going to upload this to YouTube. And then I will post it on YouTube and I will post an announcement on our Canvas site for the distance students to let you know that you can actually begin to watch this YouTube video. If you have any questions at all for the distance class, any questions whatsoever, feel free to post your questions to the discussion board or ask me live during my office hours and during the summer, there are almost always Tuesday evenings and Thursday afternoons. But that's it. That's all for Chapter 6. I'm going to end this and just wait for that announcement so that you can watch the video.